O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, and you certainly are our Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. On Wednesday, we celebrated or remembered the 18th anniversary of 9-11. We remember the series of coordinated attacks upon our nation that claimed 2,996 lives and injured over 6,000 others. We remember the dismay that washed over us as endless news coverage reported first responders searching beneath a mountain of rubble. This week we remembered the victims and paid tribute once more to our nation's heroes, ordinary men and women who ran into harm's way when their beloved nation needed them most. And the Good Shepherd author Kenneth Bailey suggests that our modern emergency crews, whether at ground zero or in our own community, derive their name Search and Rescue from the activities of ancient shepherds. It was during a, a national emergency that the prophet Ezekiel drew upon the imagery of a shepherd when he wrote that what the Lord had promised to the people of Israel, saying, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will rescue them. And during the destruction of Jerusalem with smoke billowing in the sky, the prophet Jeremiah speaks of the Lord's search and rescue mission. And in the gospel, Jesus, in continuity with the Lord's mission in the Old Testament, is identified either as the good shepherd or one performing the tasks of a shepherd. Such as when he says of himself, concluding his conversation with Zacchaeus, saying, the Son of Man came to seek out and to save, rescue the lost. This morning, our gospel lesson begins with the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling to themselves. And under their breath, they are mumbling, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. I mean, it's obvious as day all one had to do was look around and you can see those kind of people that Jesus was talking with. But I'm here this morning to suggest that they were not drawn to Jesus because of his personality. Or his personal sense of style. I believe that ordinary folks like us sought Jesus because they discovered what drew us to Jesus in the first place. That he loved them. That he cared for them. And as strange as it may sound, Jesus stood up for them. Which is why I think it is important to notice that today's parable is not addressed to the tax collectors and the sinners, but is directed to the Pharisees and the scribes. In other words, the, the tax collectors and the sinners are overhearing what Jesus is saying to the religious folk. As Jesus begins his parable... The Pharisees and the scribes lean in when he asks, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost until he finds it? And I suspect that the Pharisees and the scribes were just about to ask some clarifying questions. 
I mean, is there somebody over there to watch the 99 so I can leave them? Or how long had the one sheep been unaccounted for? But uninterrupted, uninterrupted, Jesus continues. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. We know from experience the way that this parable is traditionally read. Usually in a traditional interpretation of this parable, one of two things happens. We either allow the subtitle ahead of the chapter to take place and to, to uh, take place over or prominence over the biblical account itself, or we provide an allegorical reading, meaning that the lost sheep represents a wayward sinner. That the owner or shepherd were never, neither one are quite distinguished from each other in the parable, depicts Jesus, and the friends and the neighbors represent the church. Don't get me wrong, I love this so called traditional reading of the parable. It is wonderful for me. It is how I came to know the love that Christ has for me. And, and it's the, how many of us have come to understand Christ's love for us. This is a wonderful way to read the parable, but it is not the only way. I love the fact that this sinner can read that parable and I know exactly what the hymn writer was talking about when the hymn writer said that I am prone to wander. This is the way that this parable has always been presented to me and it is the way that I have presented this parable time and time again. But one of the dangers of having a settled, have settled on the meaning of the scripture is that we can quickly lose the wondrous depth of the scripture that once mesmerized St. Augustine. In her fascinating book, Short Stories by Jesus, Amy Jill Levine encourages us to reread Jesus' parable with our own eyes. What we might notice is that Jesus' parable spends more time talking about the shepherd than the sheep. I mean, contrary to the subtitle above the chapter, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable is about a shepherd who lost a sheep. And it's about a shepherd who leaves the 99 in the wilderness to find the sheep that he lost. And it's the shepherd who finds it. It is the shepherd who lays down or lays the sheep across his shoulders. It is the shepherd who rejoices. It is the shepherd who calls friends and neighbors alike together to celebrate that the sheep has been found. Contrary to its traditional interpretation, not once does Jesus require that the Pharisees or the scribes identify Jesus as the owner or shepherd in the parable. Jesus sets up the parable actually inviting the Pharisees and the scribes to place themselves as the owner and the shepherd. In fact, nowhere in the parable is a sheep identified as a sinner, in the wrong, or even in need of repentance. Perhaps this is not a parable about the sheep, but of the desperate search and rescue mission of the shepherd. My worst subjects in high school, besides history, science, and English, was math. I always struggled with math, and I never realized that as a pastor, I would be required to use math so often. Luke 15 is one math problem after another. Today's parable is a shepherd who lost 1% of his flock. 
followed by a woman who lost 10% of her coins. And I'm still working on the percentage of the father who lost maybe 50% or 100% of his sons. All I know is that every time a person or every time something is found, a celebration ensues. When I first served the small congregation of Bowmansville United Methodist Church, I met Millie Whitaker. Millie Whitaker was a long-time member and one of the original apostles, I'm convinced. And she shared with me a program that their congregation had implemented. Essentially, the congregation was divided into two. It was made up of shepherds and sheep. And every shepherd had four or had five to six sheep in their flock that they kept track of. Which meant that if you missed church, not one Sunday, but two Sundays or more in a row, your shepherd would call you, because they were in charge of your flock, they would call you and check in on you to make sure that you're okay. This also meant... That when someone in your family passed away, you had five or six of the uh, uh, sheep in your flock and a shepherd who would make sure, they would organize together to make sure that you had a warm meal to eat as you and your family were grieving. It also meant that when you had a birthday or an anniversary, you could expect a, a card in the mail or somebody calling you, singing, happy birthday. I can tell you this morning that this was not a perfect system. But what it did is it ensured that not only were people counted when they showed up on Sunday morning, but they counted, they knew that they counted, they knew that they mattered beyond Sunday morning, because people were looking in after them. In Jesus' parable, the owner, the, the shepherd, is in charge with 100 head of sheep. And I'm told that's a lot of sheep to keep track of. I, I imagine at the day's end, had the shepherd not intentionally counted the sheep, he never would have known that there was one sheep still unaccounted for. And the shepherd only had a handful of sheep, four or five sheep. It's a little more obvious if one out of four and five or four or five are missing. But he had a hundred. And at the end of the day, he counted and he discovered, this is remarkable to me. He was intentional. He counted and realized, hey, there's one sheep missing. And they went out and started an old-fashioned search and rescue party to find the one sheep that he had lost. At the beginning of 2019, our congregation had 330 members on the church rolls. Since January, that number has fluctuated. Some have died and have joined the church triumphant. Others have become members of this congregation. I mean, there are those who would love to be here this morning and just are not able to for a myriad of reasons. Some have moved further away. Others find it difficult to navigate an old building. Some are tending to family members and others are working. We have a math problem. I mean, forgive me this morning if I'm not able to do the math in my head. Even if we round up, though, I don't think we have quite 330 people in worship today. 
I suppose those in the early service can assume that so-and-so is in the later service. And I suppose that we can think that if we don't see somebody here this morning, they're probably in the early service. But for the past two or three years, the previous Sunday's attendance has been printed in the bulletin. Church, we have a math problem. We need your help. We have lost track of something like 243 people in our congregation. We, like the scribes and Pharisees, are the shepherds in this parable. We are the ones who must count to make sure we haven't lost any sheep. I mean, it's easy to lose sheep when there are so many. Our task is not to point an accusatory finger at each other and blaming each other that somebody isn't here. It's not our task to point an accusatory finger at those who are, who are not here. Our response must be to link arms together and to reach out for those whose seats have not been warmed this morning. So look around you. It's okay, look around you. Take note of those who are missing from our congregation today. I mean, this is not, don't, don't, don't misrepresent what I'm saying. This is not limited to, to members, but to anyone who has ever graced this place and is not here today. So my prayer is that we will canvas our con congregation with thinking of you cards and personalized notes, letting those not here today with us know that we didn't see them in worship today. We didn't see them here at church this Sunday. And not only were, not only were they not, or not only are they on our minds, but they are also right now in our prayers. And letting them know that we miss them. Perhaps this is a small, yet very Christ-like move. Maybe that's what we are called to do as the body of Christ in this place. So fellow shepherds, join me and let the search begin. I offer this in the name of the Father, and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said.